All right, Stephen. Yes. I'm Aaron Shafawalaf. Stephen, um, Romulator? I used to go by Romulator, but I have since stopped posting on message boards and on YouTube as Romulator for a number of reasons. And so you can try looking up Romulator, but you probably won't find a lot of stuff on YouTube since I don't really do much anymore of that. I affectionately know you as Romulator. Okay, there you go. Maybe the person formerly known as Romulator or something like that. <laughs> Steve is somebody that I've uh, viewed as an up-and-coming apologist. Is that fair to say? I mean, he's a pretty smart, like, really smart course. guy. Not a pretty smart guy, a really smart guy. Um, uh, but we just had a dialogue and I asked him if we could just summarize sort of the contents of our dialogue for YouTube. And he's okay with that. Sure. Um, here, I'll let you have it. Okay, well, basically Aaron and I were discussing it was a hypothetical situation in which Thomas S. Monson uh, gets up at the pulpit at a general conference and declares that Jesus was a sinner. And the question, but he qualifies and says, this is just my own opinion, but it's my opinion that Jesus was a sinner. So with that hypothetical situation in mind, Aaron asked me if I thought that would constitute blasphemy. Um, you know, Thomas S. Monson saying something to that effect, or I guess some other egregious, you know, statement um, along those lines. And my own personal opinion, as I've thought about it, and Aaron rightly brought up the fact that this is an important question and something that I should think more about, but in my own sort of, you know, on the spot thinking about it, I feel that even though it would be a very erroneous um, opinion and idea to say that Jesus was a sinner, um, that it would be totally false and that it would be absolutely contrary to everything that we know about who Jesus was, um, if he were to say that, I don't feel that it would be blasphemy per se because he was qualifying it as his opinion. If he were to try to say that this is official doctrine, or if he were claiming it was a revelation, or if he were claiming, you know, it's official binding doctrine that should be canonized, or something to that effect, then I would probably begin to say, yeah, this is blasphemous. This is not, you know, good, uh, good stuff. Um, it's, it's blasphemy. So, those are some of my thoughts on, on that question, on Aaron's hypothetical situation. If it if he were saying as his opinion, as erroneous and wrong as it might be, um, I still don't feel it would necessarily be blasphemy unless he were trying to do it as an, an official, you know, doctrinal point. Um, and then just as a follow-up to that, sure. the, um, the nature of the kind of fruit or the evidence that would show someone disqualified as a true prophet, the kind of thing, the, the sort of the, the measuring rod, yeah. when somebody goes that far, they're no longer to be esteemed as a true prophet. If Monson said, Jesus was a sinner, yeah. and yet said it was his own opinion because he, it's not an official proclamation or it's not binding, mm -hmm. it's not canonized, I'm not sure what, what your particular standard of officiality is, but yeah. because it's not official yet, that wouldn't, a, a prophet can still be a true prophet and yet say Jesus was a sinner, hypothetically? Um, put it that way, yeah. I mean, hypothetically, they can still say really egregious, erroneous things like that in others. Um, but until they try to put it forth as an official revelation from the Lord, this is doctrine, this is our official belief, until it gets to that point, I feel that it's not necessarily blasphemy or fruits of a false prophet per se. I feel it's an erroneous, um, very misguided and false belief and opinion, but not so drastic that it's, you know, a false pro makes him a false prophet or, you know, is evidence of such. And you said that you're not really sure what Adam God, uh, what Brigham meant by Adam God. Right. But if, hypothetically, Brigham had taught Adam God, as the critics allege, um, and had even integrated it into the St. George Temple for a while, that wouldn't yet constitute something that's blasphemous? I would say that's getting closer, but still not quite at the level, at least from my own standard, from my own personal belief. Um, it, would be, it would not necessarily be blasphemy, per se. Um, again, the whole issue for me revolves around, I'm still not sure what Brigham Young taught, and what exactly he was trying to get at, um, nor am I pretty sure where he was getting it from, whether, again, it was his really held firm belief or whether he claimed it to be revelation. I haven't studied it enough to say definitively, you know, look at it definitively in that sense. But um, I would say, you know, get, let's grant the possibility or the hypothetical that, yeah, you know, he was tr basically propounding it as authoritative doctrine. He was incorporating the temple and all that sort of stuff. To me, that would become, that would be getting closer to such but not necessarily, you know, still not necessarily blasphemy per se. Okay. So, just I, my own thoughts. As a thought experiment, um, we kind of think, of, we talked a little bit earlier about what is it, at least in my opinion, what is a, a holistic engagement of Mormonism, taking into consideration what the people believe, what the institution teaches, what the scripture sure. teaches, from all the different angles. Let's just say hypothetically, and this is just to draw out principles and boundaries, let's just say um, Monson got up and said Jesus was a sinner, 
that it was his own opinion. But over the course of the next five years, 90% of the leadership, 90% uh, of the of the membership, uh -huh. went on to believe it. So it was a widely influential teaching. Yeah. Um, it was. Uh, let's say there was disagreement amongst the 12 about it, but m many of the apostles agreed with it. It's not yet canonized and not yet put in official proclamation. And you have a situation where 90% of the church, hypothetically, believes that Jesus was a sinner. Mm -hmm. There's still true prophets and apostles and the church is still true? Yes. Even if it's a really misinformed belief and a, a false belief. I think it was Bruce R. McConkie who said to the effect that the Lord permits false doctrine to be taught in and out of the church for whatever reasons, uh, again, I'm not exactly sure of the context of Ellen McConkie's quote, but I do recall reading that at some point. Um, so yeah, I mean, even if it were to become very widely believed um, throughout the church membership, um, even if it were to become influential, which personally I think would be very unfortunate, and um, it's a good thing we're talking hypotheticals because I still don't think it's very likely, but uh, if that were to be the case, I would again see it as prophets are fallible, prophets can have fallible, fallacious beliefs about things and still be prophets. And uh, if it were to be widespread in the church, I think it would be really unfortunate and really sad. Um, but I still don't think that that would be evidence of uh, the, the church as itself, as a, you know, an organized priesthood-led Church of Christ, you know, being led by God's authorized servants. I don't think that that would be compromised. Yeah. What do you personally believe is meant when the church leaders have taught that the the prophets will never lead the people astray. Yeah. Um, I've understood that to mean that the prophets will never lead the church so uh, far left field, you might say, that the church is destroyed, like another great apostasy, you might say. Which uh -huh. destruction you, I, sorry, I assume you define as sort of the lack of priesthood authority? Yeah. So like loss of priesthood keys, uh, a total, you know, warping of an understanding of the gospel and doctrine and, and so forth. Uh, my understanding has been that, that uh, when it says they'll not leave the church astray, we're not going to have another great apostasy, in other words. You know, the keys will remain here, and as fallible as they are, the leaders of the church will continue to, to lead the church to the best of their ability, and uh, um, the things will be okay. So. Is doctrine a part of your doctrine? <laughs> Is doctrine a part of your understanding of what the great apostasy was? Another, like I, when I read gospel principles, part of the the meat of what it means for there have to have been a great apostasy is that um, pagan beliefs about the nature of God and uh, you know basically that what, what Mormons believe to be the Trinity, um, the what we think about the, traditional Christians teach about the Trinity. Mm -hmm. That's sort of in, implicitly incorporated in the in gospel principles as one of the the parts of the great apostasy or the evidences? I, mean, I guess what role does doctrine, theology have yeah. in your belief of what the great apostasy is? Well, um, for one thing, I believe a departure from uh, biblical teachings. Um, I believe, for example, the, the Trinity, Nicene Trinitarianism, and uh, some of these other popular or Christian doctrines that became very popular and became in vogue and that were propounded in these creeds and so forth. Um, I think that departure from scriptural or canonical teaching is a good indication of the apostasy or that there is an apostasy. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Your, your question was if, sort, if of, the church, was sort of, uh, you know, sort of ambiguous. I'm sorry. Make it more specific. If the church today went back to believing in traditional Trinitarianism, yeah. would that constitute apostasy? If it's, un if it, I'm sorry, if it's unofficial, if it's widely held by most members, if it's um, almost unanimously believed by the quorum of the 12, the, the, the 15, yeah. um, but it's not yet put out in an official proclamation, yet it's part of the sort of the breath and the life and the culture of the church and the correlation material and the manuals. If they're all teaching the Trinity you know, in 20 years, yeah. and it's yet not, not official in as much as the standards that you have of what constitutes officiality, yeah. that's not yet apostasy? I would say it's getting very close. It's right on the precipice of such. Yep. It's got to be official for it to be apostasy. And, uh, from my personal standards or my personal opinion, I would say yeah. Okay. Yep. So a personal question. Sure. Um, why is officiality more of a determining factor of what constitutes blasphemy and the fruits of a false prophet? Why is that more for, for you a more of a determining factor than just theological content or teaching content? So just, just in and of itself, why, so why does, if I understand your question, why does it have to be official before it's blasphemy? Why can't it just be blasphemy in and of itself? 
Is that sort of what you're getting at? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if somebody, like we said earlier, if I unofficially insulted your mom or your wife, like that would be dishonorable. That'd be, you know, worthy of an apology, repentance. But it, it, how much more if somebody unofficially insults who God is and says he was once a sinner or something like that? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really know. I haven't really thought about it enough to be able to say X, Y, and Z reason. That's just sort of, as I've studied and looked at these things and as I've formulated my own opinions on things, that's sort of the conclusion I came to. But I couldn't fully explain exactly why, you know, I have it that way or why I believe that way at this time. Do you want to finish it off with anything? Nope. Give you the mic? No, nope, nothing at all. Just thanks for the opportunity and for the interview. And uh, Do you want to ask me any tough questions? No, nope, that's okay. It's just, sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> You're going to regret this for another six months. No, no, no. Playing, no, no, no. It's, it's fine. I don't, I don't mind. And, you know, I know that you sort of have your mission. You have your, your witnessing to Mormons and you have a very, uh, a very clear idea of, you know, what you want to accomplish. And uh, I take it that this video is, you know, one of those, uh, one of those things you're trying to do with yeah, witness. It's an exposure video. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I don't want to get too much into stuff or take too much, you know, okay. emphasis out of what you want to do, you know. And so, no, I don't have any questions, nothing else. Just, again, thanks for the interview. and Thanks for being polite. And, um, I wish you the best in your, yeah, your, you, your time at BYU. So. Yeah, thanks so much. Take care. Take care.